Now I have this uh, beautiful privilege to introduce our chief guest for the night. He's joining us uh, remotely from Chicago, uh, Professor Deepesh Chakrabarti. Now, okay, yeah, there he is. So we are honored and delighted to welcome Professor Deepesh Chakrabarti as the chief guest of our Diamond Jubilee ceremony. Professor Chakrabarti is a historian whose work has revolutionized nationalist and post-colonial his historiographies, especially of the modern South Asia. Uh, I'm taking the liberty of changing this back to modern Indian subcontinent. Traditionally, it was the Indian subcontinent. Why should we lose our status by calling it South Asia? It still is the Indian subcontinent. He is currently Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor of History, South Asian Languages and Civilizations, and the college at the University of Chicago. He is also the faculty director of the University of Chicago Center in Delhi, a faculty fellow of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, an associate of the Department of English, and a faculty member at the law school by courtesy. In addition, he is an associate at the University of Technology, Sydney in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Professor Chakrabarti is a founding member of the Subaltern Studies Editorial Collective, a consultant editor of the Critical Inquiry Journal, a founding editor of the Postcolonial Studies Journal, and a member of the editorial boards of the American Historical Review and Public Culture. He was one of the founding editors of the South Asia Across Disciplines series, which was published by a consortium of three university presses, namely Chicago, Columbia, and California. Following in the footsteps of the great historian E.P. Thompson, whose making of the English working class served as a model for future social history, and guided by Professor Chakrabarti's mentor, Ranajit Guha, he embarked on what was to be a path-breaking history of the formation of working class in India. So welcome to you, Professor Chakrabarti. Thank you so much. I hand, hand over the podium to him. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks also to the authority of the Institute, the, the, the director, Dr. Uh, Sakar, and Dr. Uh, Sakurovsky, and Dr. Uh, Sakurovsky, and for this, to me, this is a relationship with this from the Diamond Jubilee, the location of Sydney, the Diamond Jubilee, of the Institute. Um, <coughs> it's obviously a matter of great honor to be included. Invited. Dr. Sarkar, among others, <coughs> uh, who were instrumental and uh, and very much played a role in my formation. Um, today also happens to be Nehru's birthday. So I also remember him as the architect of the policies that led to the setting up of the IITs and the IIMs. <clears throat> the IIM, today I'm, a, I'm speaking to you as a historian. Um, I did my undergraduate uh, in science degree I had knowledge in physics. And it's really IIM that allowed me to move into the social sciences, into the human sciences, which is probably where my heart was. And that's because of the kind of wonderful, flexible educational system that the Institute built. Um, <clears throat> the Institute was always in my time, and I'm sure it still is, was always extremely sensitive to the question of uh, the environment in which businesses operated. And, uh, and I remember that the first, very, one of the very first courses we had to do with my Professor Barunde <clears throat> uh, in our very first uh, term was called uh, Historical Roots of Economic Backwardness. And so it clearly reflected a time when um, the concern of the Institute, um, and I guess the concern of the government in setting up uh, Institutes of Technology and Institutes of Management was to um, think about what kind of managers, what kind of technologies we should produce for a country that still had a food problem, had a lot of people in poverty, 
Uh, and of course, the, all these were thoughts before globalization became uh, a worldwide phenomenon. And it, it's not surprising that, uh, I mean, I think I'm an, I'm an outlier in having become a historian, but many of my um, a minority, but still several of my um, cohorts uh, became uh, either economists like Sushil Khanna did, which was a was a year junior to me, or um, <clears throat> or sometimes they even became leaders of um, uh, non governmental organizations and made their careers in in those fields. And that partly came out of uh, this uh, idea that that India had set up business schools uh, that were not operating necessarily in the American environment, though that we're learning a huge amount from American um, in, uh, predecessor institutions. Uh, it's in, <clears throat> so it's really in that spirit that I'm sharing some thoughts with you. I mean, I, I'm not a business school professor anymore. I mean, I have friends in, the, in our business school, including Raghuram Rajan, who is a good friend. So uh, it's not like we don't uh, talk about issues of shared interest. And one of the, questions, one of the issues that have been rising to prominence in campuses across America and elsewhere in the world is the question of climate change. Sorry, I'm getting feedback. Um, okay. Um, so, so my university has just set up a university-wide committee uh, with representatives from all disciplines to talk about how there might be university-wide curriculum on questions of energy and climate change. And, and uh, so what I'm going to do today is uh, talk about uh, my understanding of the problem of climate change and uh, energy, but within a larger perspective of human history and what's been uh, happening in the world for humans, let's say over the last um, seven decades, I mean, let, from the end of the uh, Second World War or uh, from the 1950s. So I'll give you a very important history of, th of that, uh, that history and, uh, and uh, maybe sort of tease some thoughts out of uh, that history to, to share with you. But I should begin with the word Anthropocene, which is in the title of my talk and, and explaining it. Um, <clears throat> so before I talk about it, let me just say as a proposition, and this probably will become the, the, the meaning of this will become clear as, as my talk progresses, um, that today we are living in a world in which willy-nilly, we have to think about the planet and how it works. And in my language, it's, it's, it's kind of an encounter with deep history that uh, we really didn't have. That it's not something we experienced in the 20th century, though the problems are not, not of simply of 21st century origin. Um, and to tell that story, I'll, I'll begin with, the, with explaining the word Anthropocene. I've probably taken up five minutes of my allotted time, so I'll just time myself for another 35 minutes and, uh, and then uh, maybe take up um, the, um, continue the discussion in the Q&A session, the short Q&A session that we had. So the word Anthropocene uh, came out accidentally when a very well-known um, chemist, uh, a Nobel uh, uh, winning chemist, actually, Paul Crutzen, as an, as at a meeting around the year 2000 of an organization that doesn't exist anymore, but existed, um, uh, organization called uh, International Geos Geosphere Biosphere Program. So an uh, organization that actually thought about how geology and biology function together on this planet. Um, at, it's what, one of their meetings when we're discussing what changes were happening to the planet that Professor Grutzen suddenly in a moment of anger blurted out, don't keep saying we're still in the Holocene. So Holocene is the geological name for the period in which we live, um, which is roughly dated back to 11,700 years ago, when the last ice age receded and the world warmed up. Uh, the warming up of the world led to the invention of agriculture, made agriculture possible. 
Then about 6,000 years ago, the rivers, the Ganges, the Amazon, all these rivers uh, the, the, and the seas found their present levels. And then you had the growth of urban civilization and eventually ultimately about you know, 200 years ago or the industrial revolution. Uh, and all this was made possible by the recession, by the receding of the ice age, by the, by the, by the fact that the, that the snow receded. Uh, and it's this warming that allowed human civilization as we know it to flourish. And so normally in geological thinking in periodizing the history of the planet, they have always described this period as the Holocene, which just means recent times. And Kratzen said, we are not in the Holocene anymore. We are in the Anthropocene. And meaning that the human footprint on the planet was so large that it was shaping uh, the planet as a whole. And therefore, his claim that we had exited the Holocene and we entered the Anthropocene, that's how it, that's how it began. So it began at somebody's angry remark. But people found it very productive to work with it. And the word is not formalized. It may not ever be formalized. There's a long process in the discipline of geology by which names become formal. But statigraphers who are in charge of uh, arguing uh, about what period we're in geologically uh, set up a committee in London and they produced an enormous amount of evidence uh, to make the claim, which they will, uh, with no guarantee that will be accepted that our geological period be renamed after human beings, that it be called Anthropocene because of the human footprint on the planet. Now that's led to a lot of debates among geologists, outside geology, I don't need to go into this, but <clears throat> this, uh, this gathering, this organization that I mentioned, which was called the International uh, Geosphere Biosphere Program, uh, was came out of the realization that on this planet, geology and biology were connected. I'm just moving a little back. This goes back to the fact that NASA set up, uh, the first time they set up uh, uh, a committee on something called Earth System Science it was 1983. So it's, it's a very recent science. And Earth System, this idea came, again came to embody uh, the, the understanding that this is a planet on which you cannot separate the history of life from the history of geology, from, from the Earth's history. And these things in turn go back to the 1960s. Uh, and as a, in fact, in the period of the Cold War and the technological competition between Soviet Union and the United States, uh, the fact that the superpowers were testing nuclear bombs, uh, the fact that they wanted to have military technology to be able to weaponize weather, all these things uh, gave rise to an interest in the atmosphere. So the American president got a scientific advice every year on the state of the world's atmosphere. And atmospheric sciences, uh, Paul Hudson was an atmospheric scientist. He actually helped fix the problem with the ozone, the hole in the ozone layer, uh, uh, which as you know, uh, gave rise to the Montreal Protocol. And that was critical in the setting up eventually of the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, that we now have. So, Every year he got advice and, and because of space competition, the Americans were interested to find out if, if Mars could be inhabited and if Mars once had life. And this, all this was handed over to um, uh, Carl Sagan's unit in NASA. And Carl Sagan's unit hired a British chemist called James Lovelock who worked with NASA from 60 to 61. And in trying to find out if Mars could be inhabited by human beings, they began to ask a more fundamental question, like what life was, what makes a planet habitable? And, and that, uh, and you know, these were not biologists, I and mean, they were eventually joined by biologists. In fact, Carl Sagan's uh, wife later divorced Lynn Margulis was to join them. But this chemist, James Lovelock, uh, worked out intuitively that life plays a role on this planet in the maintenance of life, that is complex multicellular life. And he, he worked it out that, um, and, and he therefore thought of, you know, through the image of a Greek goddess, he called this system Gaia. He said, it, you know, it's like almost a homeostatic system that maintains itself. Uh, and that initially was a poetic intuition that when people began to research the geology and, and the biology of the planet, 
it eventually became a scientific understanding and gave rise to uh, this science called Earth System Science, which is the science behind the science of climate change. And, and, it's, and they use the word system. So you can also see that the development of systems thinking from the 1930s on had an influence on, on this science. And, and they use the word system in the singular uh, to describe Earth System Science. And um, this Earth System um, Science, uh, the, the interesting thing about it was that it this that this earth system was both a conceptual entity i mean it was created by scientists so it was a kind of heuristic model but that was also trying to approximate the reality of how the how the how this planet works and uh, fundamentally so the science comes out of the cold war it comes out of the technologies that were creating the problems for instance um, they found out the planet was warming up because of human use of fossil fuel as a cheap of uh, plentiful and, and as a source of cheap and plentiful energy. But the same boring technology, the, the drilling technology that actually helped to get gas out of, out of the earth, also helped them to create, uh, to actually measure the warming of the planet because the only way they could tell that the planet had been warming up and what the temperature of the air was like 800,000 years ago, for instance, was by boring into polar ice and by bringing out trapped air bubbles, ancient air bubbles. So in a way, um, I mean, the reason I mentioned the question of technology is that we are faced with a problem that probably has been created by uh, our, our uh, well-being and our expansion of numbers, technology, all of those things, but there's no going forward without technology or business or politicians participating in the process. And that's why I think it's critical that, uh, that business schools and uh, uh, politicians and business people and managers have an understanding of what is the problem we face. Uh, now I should say that the problem was caused mainly by industrialized nations of the world. I mean, India is not really so much at fault for causing the problem. Uh, but it's also a problem where you can't afford to think that not my fault means not my problem. It, 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 it's not our fault, but it's also our problem. Uh, so with that, let me to give you a very quick history. I just want to share some slides with you before I... Um, so I'll uh, do the share screen button and, and go, go to my slides. Uh, and then... Okay, can you see them? Can somebody show me a thumb or something? To, to, uh, so I'm assuming that you can see them. Okay, so Will Stefan, who is one of the authors of this paper, is actually one of the Earth System scientists. Um, and these are called great acceleration graphs. So they basically very quickly tell you the story of what's been happening in human history. Um, but before I show you the graphs, let me just say that that the 20th century was a century of enormous expansion of what I would call the human realm. Um, and uh, so world irrigated areas, for instance, in this century increased um, uh, almost seven times. Uh, the human population increased from 1.5 billion to 6 billion. So, you know, human, I mean, humans have been around for 300,000 years. It almost took us that amount of time to get to the figure 1 billion. At the end of the 20th century, we were 6 billion, now 8. Uh, the world economy increased 15-fold, energy use increased from 13 to 14-fold, freshwater use increased 9-fold, irrigated areas by 5-fold. Uh, the world population increased four times uh, in the 20th century, 3.8. Urban population, that's a very important thing. I mean, the world has been becoming more and more urban. So all the predictions are that the humans will be a, a her urban dwelling species by the end of the century. But in the 20th century, urban population grew almost 13 times. Uh, energy grew 300 times. Uh, water used nine times. Fertilizer used 342 times. Fish cats, 65 times. Uh, organic chemical production, 1,000 times. Car ownership grew about 8,000 times. And of course, uh, CO2 also increased. Uh, so now I go to the graphs and the graphs will tell the same story. 
except with one difference that if you look at all the figures for population, real GDP, foreign direct investment, everything goes, I mean, and look at this dotted line, vertical line, they go up exponentially from 1950 on. In fact, um, I recently, of all the fossil fuel that humans have consumed, 87% of it was consumed after 1950. So really, the, the, this is the, so that's why they use the word accelerated. We increased numbers, we increased our consumption, we lived well. Now, uh, uh, the next set of graphs, the, the, the OECD countries and the enormous post for reconstruction of the economies and the BRICS had their shared and others. Um, if, if this was only the story we had in a world that a professor of psychology at Harvard, very popular uh, uh, professor called Steve Pinker writes in many of his books, there is human beings are improving their condition. I mean, in a way, this is the story of what might say what we owe to fossil fuels. Because without the uh, capacity to uh, move medicine, food from one part of them, had the capacity to sustain more human beings and sustain them individually. So, the, so even the, the, the lifespan of and the longevity of the poor increased. I mean, they didn't have good lives, but the longevity um, but they, they lived longer. And uh, so, if, if, so in a way, this, this is the human story of world history. And if you think back to uh, what were the main issues in world history from 1950 to uh, 2000, you will think about decolonization sitting in India, that many new nations emerged. They were trying to solve their food problems. People like Nehru and Nasser were very interested in American big dams technology, because this was before fertilizers and the major problem was feeding population. So they thought we need more irrigation, we need more power and dams would be the way to do it. Today we're more critical of those, some of those measures, but that's how they were thinking. Uh, this was the period of civil liberties movement in, uh, in America. Uh, indigenous people's movements throughout the world. Uh, this was the period when, um, uh, anti-colonial theorists like Franz Fanon was being read all over the world. If you look at the 70s, this was the time when the second wave feminism came. So we became much more aware of gender rights. Um, there were some warning bells. Uh, in 1962, the American environmental activist, Rachel Carson, published her book, Silent Spring, which actually was showing what the problems were with DDT, which played a tremendously important role in um, in uh, the eradication of malaria, but she was actually showing that DDT was not only causing cancer, it was killing birds, which is why the spring was going to be silent. That was 62. And in 1972, a bunch of economists from MIT, uh, they were normally called the Club of Rome because they met in Rome, came out with a report uh, trying to argue that you could not have infinite growth on a limits to growth, it was called on a finite planet. Uh, but <clears throat> but then fertilizers were uh, in invented. We had uh, the high yielding variety of uh, wheat being available. Um, uh, and from the end of the 60s, there was a boom in food production in India. So, and then if you think of the 70s, 80s, think of Kanshira, Mayavati, the assertion of low caste, you know, and uh, the Dalits in Indian politics. So. This is a story of human flourishing, people becoming more aware of their rights, so much so that, <clears throat> that uh, a very well-known American historian uh, at Harvard, Charles Meyer, was asked to write a his, an article in American Historical Review in the year 2000, which was called Consigning the 20th Century to History, and he had not a word to say about climate change, even though the IPCC had been set up around 1988 or 89, the Rio conference had taken place in 92. In the Rio conference, two Indian activists, 
Sunita Narayan and Anil Agarwal has forcibly argued, an argument that we would accepted that greenhouse gas emissions would be should be calculated on a per capita basis to show who was at fault, um, who had historical responsibility for the problem. Um, so, so this was actually a period of, you might say, both a period that created the global world that made the world accessible to more and more human beings. This is a period where if you <clears throat> look at the statistics for uh, the number of people who became consumers, like people who could buy afford to buy uh, consumer gadgets, fridges and cars. So it took humanity again until 1986 to have 1 billion consumers. Then we added the second uh, billion in 21 years, the third billion in nine years, and we're probably on our way to add the fourth billion in seven years. So there's been an acceleration of, of or even of the rate at which people are becoming consumers. And, that, and then when you look at the uh, statistics of from where do these consumers come, you will find that if you look at the statistics for 2000, the consumers are mostly from the industrialized West. And today, the share of the industrialized the North Atlantic countries or Japan in the total number of people that you would count as consumers is 35%. So 65% of them come from China, India, uh, the elites of Africa, Latin America, and other places. So if you purely told this story in human terms, <clears throat> then it really would be a Steve Pinker story of human beings living better and better. But the key thing was that human beings were also becoming more and more urban. And when you become urban, you're, at least for the elites, your sense of the connection to land, the connection to natural processes, it gets a little warped because you begin to, any big city operates by its citizens taking food, water, and electricity for granted. Now, we only notice of the crisis when we go to the shops and suddenly there's no, no food there. But what the system scientists were saying, because they were saying, this is not the whole story. The next part of the story has to do with how the Earth system, or what I call the planet, was reacting. In other words, this is the, the impact side. And the top, and again, they have this graph from 1950. So you see a very strong correlation that carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, the three main greenhouse gases, uh, uh, are all going up, the emissions are going up from, uh, uh, from 1950 on. And that's the depletion of ozone layer, ocean acidification. Now, this is a very interesting story. If the oceans become more acidic, then little creatures like shells that create uh, shells uh, to, to kind of to protect themselves cannot create those cells, shells because the acid dissolves them. So, um, the other stories, for instance, 50% of the oxygen we breathe, when without which can we, we cannot live, and, and our atmosphere is such that because oxygen is a reactive gas, you need to supply it constantly with fresh oxygen. And we don't do it. We depend on that oxygen being supplied, but we don't do it. It's really tiny creatures like bacteria, fungi, uh, plants, and uh, these things called phytoplanktons, which are like sea uh, plants, but very tiny. Uh, phytoplanktons on their own produce 50% of the oxygen we breathe. So if we, I mean, this, we're not anywhere near this danger, but I saw some models where they said that if the average temperature of the seas went up by five, six degrees, and we're not near that, then the phytoplankton will die and will be shutting off uh, a great source of oxygen that we need. So this is how they were in the great acceleration story. They were trying to connect the story of um, uh, the story of uh, human flourishing with the story of what was happening to the earth as a system, as a, that is to this planet where geology and biology are connected. Uh, <clears throat> so these are graphs that kind of continue with the story, the, red, the graphs I just showed you that um, uh, finished, that sort of ended uh, from 1950 to 2000, these carry on the story from 1990 to 2020. This was published in Bioscience. And the one hopeful and positive thing that you see is the decline in human fertility, uh, which is a good thing. But all other graphs mostly are uh, upwards. And, uh, and if you actually refine these graphs, you'll, you'll see that 
they they actually become steeper once China joins and becomes the manufacturing hub of the world. Um, so, uh, let me, okay. So this is, again, this is like, you had them in orange and, and blue, they, these are not colored, but they again show you uh, how the planet is reacting to, or, uh, to human activities. Um, I'll stop sharing and, okay, go back to the screen. So there is a geologist called Peter Half at Duke University who actually argues that um, without technology, and this is why technology is very important, that without technology, what he calls the technosphere, all the connectivity that we have, um, humans wouldn't be able to sustain eight or 10 billion uh, uh, people on the planet. Uh, and in fact, he has some calculations where he shows that if you took away all the technology that connects us, human population would crash to somewhere like 11 million. So, so while the expansion of the human realm is, is causing some of the problems, it is also, um, <clears throat> we, we cannot go forward, as I was saying, without uh, business and technology and technologists and scientists being on board with, with the solving of the problem. So clearly, um, the other thing I want to also say is that the pandemic that we're going through is not unconnected to the question of this expansion of human realm. So Anthony Fauci uh, and uh, his colleague David Morens have been publishing uh, uh, papers, scientific papers, and others have been arguing this too, that they argue that we have now entered an era of pandemics. That in the last uh, 17 or so years, we've had five potential pandemics, and one of them has become a real pandemic. And they're saying, that we might actually going forward have more pandemics coming more frequently. So again, the, the larger argument is that pandemics have been part of human society for a very long time. Uh, once we domesticated uh, animals, uh, it, we got viruses and bacteria sort of jumped hosts, which is often called spillover. They spilled over from animals to us. But in the older uh, history of human beings, it sometimes took us thousands of years to get used to the viruses and bacteria in, 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 in animals that we deal with, which is why, but we got, we reached some sort of equilibrium, which is why they say that your dog can accidentally give you an illness that can kill you, but your dog won't produce a pandemic. So they also find that 70% that of the emergent infectious diseases in the last 20 years, have been of have been zoonotic in character. That is, they have they are caused by viruses that jump host from wild animals to human beings through intermediate animals. And because wild animals don't seek us out, the only way that viruses and bacteria can jump species from wild animals to us is if they lose their habitat. And that has to do with destruction of forests. That has to do with building roads in forests. That has to do with the increase of human habitation. That is not just simply a part of the energy problem. That is why I'm calling there's an expansion of the human realm that, 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 that's been going on. And, and what you also realize that on the, while on the one hand, the emergence of antibiotic in the 1930s has tremendously contributed to human lifespan and, and the growth of our um, our, our species. I mean, I myself is a beneficiary of antibiotic. I mean, I had the disease when I was 17, which would have killed me if antibiotics were not available. Um, but, but antibiotics and these other things also represent uh, a mode of, uh, what do you say, the encounter with the microbial world, the, our scientific encounter with the microbial world. I mean, we only get to know about the microbial world once we have Something like something like an equipment like microscope, and what they say that in that history, every time human beings invent a way of dealing with microbes, that particular way becomes an evolutionary pathway for the microbes. So once you develop antibiotics to deal with a group of bacteria, the end result over decades is that we end up with antibiotic resistant bacteria. And they give many examples with all other human interventions. So they actually say that um, that this that the, anti, the, the the pandemic also shows that we're 
we are not out of a Darwinian history of life. While, while we are trying to find vaccinations and there are absolutely intra-human questions of justice, equity of vaccinations, access to vaccinations, distribution of vaccinations, the rich poor question, the pandemic sh has showed up everywhere, the question of digital divide in the world and access to education. So while these human inequalities are real and need to be addressed, the pandemic also shows that, that the human body has become an evolutionary pathway for this coronavirus too, uh, so when we say, when we talk about the Delta variant or this variant, what we're talking about is that is the fact that the virus is evolving. Now, of course, you know, we'll, we'll deal with this virus uh, at some, uh, which has caused a lot of human tragedy. Um, but the point that they're making is that the, the expansion of the human realm is the main reason, the cutting down of forests. And I read somewhere in Nature, I think, that if we cut down 25% of the current forest cover, we are in real danger. And, and we are at 17% at the moment. So the Harvard biologist, E.H. Wilson, Edward Wilson, a very respected biologist, came out with a book called Half Earth. And uh, his argument, his, his proposition, which, which on immediate hearing sounds utopian, he was actually arguing that humans should leave at least half of the planet's surface for other forms of life. Because one, one thing you also realize uh, in reading this literature, that humans are a minority form of life. The majority forms of life on the planet are microbial. So not even insects, they're microbes. And this microbe, I mean, the reason why I say this is an encounter with deep history, so when you read the history of Earth system, how, what is the history of life on this planet, you also realize that microbes are fundamental to not only to the maintenance of the atmosphere, but to the history of life. I mean, these little things keep life going. And if life, you think of life as a, as a multi-story building, we're like on the 16th, 17th floor or somewhere, or you know, on the top floor of a skyscraper. These are the things that work at the basis of life and keep life going. And, and therefore, Wilson was arguing that biodiversity, species extinction is something we need to pay attention to collectively. Now, Obviously, there's no question of humans uh, giving up half of the land surface to, uh, to other forms of life. But, the, but really, the question he's talking about is a sort of Gandhian principle, I think, that Mr. Kulkani was talking about. The question is, how do we find forms of withdrawal, forms of, uh, um, forms of kind of uh, shaping the human realm in such a way that we still address the questions of justice and and human and human well-being without damaging that well-being in the long run. And, and one, of the, one of the proposals he has actually, uh, I think it's a concrete proposal, is to convert or to return all the designated national parks of the world, and I think there are 145 or 140 something of them, to the pristine condition that they had before humans took out capstone species, which were sometimes animals, sometimes uh, um, trees, for instance. But what I come back to then, um, and I'm now getting to the end of my uh, uh, talk, I've got five more minutes left, and I may not need even five more minutes, is to say that, um, that we are at a situation where we cannot afford to forget uh, how the world works, how the planet works, as we did in the second half of the 20th century. So it was not accidental that Charles Meyer, the Harvard historian, didn't have a word to say about climate change when, uh, when he wrote that essay called Consigning the 20th Century to History. The 20th century was all about aspirations, the end of the 20th century, and those are legitimate aspirations that some of which I've mentioned. But these aspirations are now clashing with what is happening uh, to the planet. And without the planet remaining healthy, we don't survive. And you know, to give you a quick example of the kind of choices people are making, and this is where we need we need to enable them to make other kinds of choices. Uh, there's a story uh, that economists and uh, New York Times journalists have told of the sale of air conditioners in India. Now, Indian air conditioners, conditioners on the whole, employ uh, older technology. 
and uh, and what they give out is not good for uh, Indian cities. Um, and when nations met in Rwanda in 2016 to come to an agreement about air conditioners, India actually bargained hard to be amongst the countries that would be the slowest to change. And the reason for that uh, is that uh, the cities are becoming heat islands and the demand for air conditioners is growing in India, uh, not because people want their second and third and fourth unit, but it's actually growing because people are buying their first units ever in their life. And there are cases in Delhi where even people are move, pulling money together to buy air conditioners. Now, in, in, in hot circumstances, air conditioners do save lives. There have been historical studies in Texas, for instance, showing that, uh, that, uh, that air conditioning of households actually saves lives. And when people interview these people who are buying air conditioners, the, the, uh, really the answers are all about aspirations. And these aspirations are very critical in the Indian political system. So a mother, for instance, says, well, it's for the first time that my children could sit up all night and prepare for their competitive exams uh, without getting eaten up by mosquitoes. Or somebody says, it's the first time in my life that I actually slept well. I, I found out what a good sleep was. I never slept well before. And these are all legitimate questions. And if you ask these people, but you know, the way in which you're finding well-being is also making the city even hotter. And it might become unlivable. And their answer would be, well, if my children can do their exams and get, get the skills they need to get, then maybe by the time the city becomes unlivable, they can go somewhere else. And within that answer, I have to make my final point, is the dilemma we face, which is that when we aspire, we aspire knowing that the world is uneven, knowing that somewhere else is better and we can move there. And that's what even animals do. When climate becomes unlivable, they move somewhere else. And in the way that the world is going, some places will become uninhabitable, particularly places that eventually develop what they call wet bulb conditions, where it's enormously hot and humid at the same time so that you can't perspire and people die in, in those conditions. Um, so people will move. And so we are now faced with a world where we think about people having to move. So we have to be more welcoming of immigrants rather than unwelcoming of them. Uh, in European countries, it means, or in America, it means we have to be less racist uh, than, than more racist. Um, we are also uh, living in that world where, um, <clears throat> as I said, many people are not at fault for what's happened, the story of industrialization, but it's everybody's problem. And, and India is particularly exposed because of this coastline and the glaciers. Uh, one of the most interesting facts about the Himalayan glaciers is that we still, not just India, all the countries that benefit from those glaciers. So the Himalayas, uh, there are say, seven, eight rivers coming out of the Himalayas that actually feed service eight or nine countries from Pakistan to Vietnam. But the Himalayas become, have become the most militarized mountain range in the world because most of the nations think of the, the area geopolitically, but not ecologically. And, and we need to move towards a politics where nations come together to think about how to save those glaciers, maintain their health. And so we need new kinds of politics. We need new kind of thinking. And, 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 and that's what, that's, so this new imagination of the planet in which life and geology come together in which we appreciate the role that microbes and other so-called inferior forms of life play in maintaining complex life, in allowing our prosperity uh, possible. Uh, the planet in which people will have to move. I mean, it's no longer the age of empires when European can just get, go and grab other people's lands. People, the, the UN number of refugees that was two years ago was 65 or 67 million. That figure may rise to 300 million. In the, in, the, in the coming decades. And we don't have uh, even an official category of climate refugees yet. So on the other hand, if I, when I travel in Europe, I've just come back from Poland, they're all developing anti-immigration policies, not all, but most of them are. And we've seen that those sort of sentiments in America, and, but we'll have to share this world in which some places will become less habitable. So 
uh, while nation states will remain, but we become a global world, we have these very, two contradictory, very large facts coming together. One is that we have one planet, but we have many worlds. One planet does not mean we have one world. And that's why when you look at the timetable that IPCC gives out for action, the COP conferences, you know, the carbon budgets and figures and all that, IPCC gives out a planetary calendar. And we are always struggling to make an uneven world, uh, a kind of fragmented humanity, meet that one planet calendar. And that's partly the problem we face, which is that whenever IPCC gives out a one planet calendar, the nations come together to bargain on legitimate ground, how much time they can extract uh, in the bargaining process. I'll finish quoting a French uh, uh, thinker, a young French uh, political economist called Pierre Chabonnet, who recently wrote a very interesting book. Uh, actually, Macron called him in for a discussion on this book on, it's called Liberty and Affluence. It's just come out in English. And I was in Paris recently, and, and over a cup of tea, Pierre was saying to me, Dipesh, we humans need to give our children ecological awareness in the same way that we teach them the number systems. So children of future will have to grow up with different kinds of awareness. And of course, this doesn't happen overnight. We begin now, we begin today. As an educator, I feel we need to message this. Solutions will be different. People will disagree on what the solution is. But we need to understand, have a shared common understanding of the problem. And that's why I think this is something that is critical to business leadership is critical, managerial leadership is critical, and therefore, this is a theme that ought to be taken up by business schools too. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your time and your valuable inputs. May I request the director to moderate the Q&A session now? Uh, questions from the audience, please. Uh, if you may, please raise your hand and you will send a hand mic. I hope it will be audible. If not, we may request you to come to the podium. It would be good if you please identify yourself briefly. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for the wonderful. I lecture. can't hear you. Am I audible? Sorry, I'm not. Uh, Professor Chakraborty, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Better now. Okay. Okay. Just a minute. Just a minute. Am I audible, sir? Uh, yeah. This is the slide. Uh, keep speaking, and then I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, so thank you, sir, for the wonderful lecture. We learned a lot from it. Uh, I just was wondering when you were talking about the pandemic situation. So as you mentioned that the pan there were four to five pandemics which was about to hit our economy. And one pandemic finally hit us in the year 2019. Now it uh, went, it uh, led me to wonder that when the pandemic actually hit, there was a three to four months gap from the time when it started in one of the nations of the world till the time it became it had a worldwide impact now there are two impacts which happens to because of this one is the economic impact and the second is the uh, impact on the lives of the people while in order to curtail the second one there are certain technological improvements or researches which needs to be done and which can happen only after the pandemic hits but talking about the economic preparedness, do you think the nations across the world can have something prepared in advance so that the economic impact of this pandemic is not that huge? What do we learn from this pandemic? So that's a very good question. So there are two kinds of uh, responses, long term and, and short term, but also they're, they're kind of philosophically different. So some of the virologists actually uh, there's a virologist called nathan wolf if you read him in a popular book called the vital storm you'll find out some of some of the solutions that people are seeking is in the direction of global governance 
So making, giving WHO more teeth and power. Uh, the early debates about the Chinese reluctance to share information. Uh, uh, even contemporary debates about to, to what degree this was, you know, deliberate in China or not. So, so these are, so these are, there are many problems that in some ways require global governance and, and um, Nathan Wolf and his colleagues often suggest that we create a kind of sort of a commando force for dealing with pandemics. In other words, an early warning system. And one proposal they have is actually of deploying satellite telephone and satellite telephone as a way of detecting where a potential pandemic is breaking out because, um, because they're saying that if a pandemic breaks out, it leads to chatter in the same way that you track sort of terrorists, for instance. Uh, that you could check, you could track pandemic chapter and immediately sort of swoop down within a nation and uh, and isolate the population that's suffering it so that it's not allowed to spread. Spread. Now that's a kind of global approach, and I'm not saying it it it, it doesn't have any merits, but it requires nation states to cede some of their powers in the face of a pandemic. And then it's sort of there will be sort of politics, you know, politics of defining whether a particular stage is a stage of pandemic, and that whenever you have an outside intervention, there's always this question of defining what is it, the problem, and that so that the outside is, the intervention is legitimate. Anthony Fauci, who was a very practical man, was advising President Trump and then Biden, and, and it's still a controversial figure because of the attack on him recently by the GOP. But Fauci, in his in, in and not just Fauci, sort of uh, David Quammen in his book on, on, on pandemics and called The Spillover. The point they make is a long-term point, which is really the loss of habitat for wildlife animals because of because the mult most of the disease is being zo of zoonotic origin. And that partly has to, again, there are intermediate animals. The pangolin story, which has never been verified uh, in, in the Chinese case. Uh, but it has to do with the fact that often the virus has come to us through an intermediate animal uh, that is sometimes traceable uh, um, or intermediate like, like, like birds like chicken, for instance. And their argument is that we need to protect the forests and not cut them down. We need to protect wildlife. We need to, we need to make sure that a virus that has lived in bats guards in some Chinese forests has, has no reason to come close to us. And that, again, goes back to what I was calling the expansion of the human realm that's happened through the last seven decades. And the question is, you know, I'm sim simply mentioning withdrawal as a principle, as a Gandhian principle, but, but we need to work out practical shapes of that principle without sacrificing human well-being, but without endangering human well-being either. See, from, from Montesquieu's time, there was an expectation in European political thought that the purpose of politics was to extend life. And that's what we've all accepted in the world, that the, that the purpose of government is to extend life, maintain life. But if we extend ourselves so much that life itself gets threatened, then some way we defeat that purpose. So, so yes, I'm there, but, but what I'm telling you is that the, the practical propositions on board at least mean much more global cooperation than we have had so far. Whereas we've had very national responses. Trump's denial of the pandemic is still fresh in my mind. Um, and which has led to certain problems. Uh, uh, the equity question of uh, vaccine, vaccine distribution, access to vaccination, those are also real questions. But in terms of preventing pandemics, so one strategy assumes that there will be more pandemics, but we will have more early warning systems we'll be able to deal with them. The other long-term strategy is to actually eliminating the root cause of or frequent pandemics. Thank you, Professor. And next question, please. Professor Jha, would you like to come? Okay. Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk about the group. Anyway. Uh, second uh, thing is, uh, I'm really, I'm really, really glad, 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 glad to see you. Uh, hopefully, you can hear us. Hear us. Hear us. You're slightly indistinct. Uh, okay. okay. If you actually, if you speak a little All right, bit right, slowly. Let me shift to yeah. a place where you can hear me better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Jha, if you could come, come, please come, come here. Come here. 
and all new community members, so I'm happy to see you, and thank you for waking up so early for us. Second is, I was just trying to uh, do a bit of kind of you know, fast forward in my head, and trying to see uh, where would it lead us. So, so no great kind of you know, uh, thoughts needed. Uh, one uh, is, of course, the dystopian future, where the planet either gets kind of, you know, uh, kind of really very badly kind of damaged, or like from your talk itself, you're saying 11 million people survive. Uh, there, I have my own questions. Who will survive? Would it be, for example, the experience of uh, pandemic, especially the second wave in India, what it teaches us? that uh, the pandemic was wealth neutral at some point, point because rich were dying, poor were dying and so on. But by and large, you know, one would expect that if these 100 million people kind of survive, or whatever, I hope that number I got right, you said 100 million. So they will be relatively better off people who can migrate, who can do things for themselves. The other, the other uh, future uh, could be the, the one which, which is a more hopeful, hopeful future, future which, which you were saying, saying for example, you took the name of Gandhi, Gandhi and uh, yeah. let me say this without any kind of hesitation, that Gandhi, Gandhi in his Gandhi own land right now, right now is not a very, uh, you, know, popular you know, popular thinker. thinker. Okay. Definitely his political ideas are kind of, you know, getting more and more kind of, you know, questioned. And uh, obviously, I think never as a nation, we took his ethic of consumption seriously. So what would make you, in some ways, hopeful about the future? That we, we are not staring at a dystopian future as a kind of, you know, species. Thank you. Sorry for a long-minded question. No, no, no. Actually, the, the Sound-wise, the question became clearer as you went along. So I got the second half of the question. Oh, okay. Uh, and if I, if I got it right, you were actually... So where I began to understand you from was when you were saying that, that Gandhi was not a popular thinker uh, in, in India now, and what would make one hopeful about the future? Yeah, so, so, so that, the, the, right? yeah, the question is that... Uh, oops, oops. How do we uh, avoid, uh, avoid a dystopian, a dystopian future, future as a species? What, what gives you hope? That is, how do we avoid the dystopian future? Sure. Is what you were asking. Yeah. Well, um, so let me <laughs> see the dystopian. Honestly, if I may uh, say so, for many people, the, the dystopia is not a future. It's in the present. It's come. <laughs> And let me give you an example from where you are. And I only get it from an article written by a woman, a young woman called Swati Bhattacharya, who wrote an article in Ananda Bazaar. And then I, I called her up and uh, I wrote to her and she wrote back to me. I know her. And she said that, you know, poor fishing women who stand waist deep in the river, in the estuaries in the Sundarban area to catch small fish with cane baskets. Didn't realize I mean, that A, the type of fish they were catching was changing. They could see that. But the reason that was changing was because the water, the water is already saline. The seawater is moving in with rising. But what the seawater was doing, and this what was giving them fungal and other kind of infections in their reproductive organs. And a lot of a team of rogue doctors had moved in to the area and were making money by doing hysterectomy on these women. And my friend Swati said that she and other feminists are trying to lobby the West Bengal government to pass a law to regulate hysterectomy. Now, I wouldn't have ever connected climate change with hysterectomy. You know, I was uh, a couple of years ago, I was in Kota giving a lecture at the Mahatma Gandhi University and the professor of physics, a lady stood up and said to me, she said, Dipesh, women poor, in poor families in the coastal areas in Kerala already have to walk long distance to get fresh water for cooking because the local water is all saline. And, and this has not emerged to be a political issue in Kerala. 
So a lot the what the dystopian future you're talking about is real in many people's lives. It's only when you don't. I'm not accusing you personally, but I'm saying it's the elite doesn't look at it usually <laughs> to see that the dystopia is here. It's not future we are talking about. It's only as people with education that we can put it away in the future <laughs> and then think how do we prevent the future. So that's why I said having one planet does not mean one world. We live in different worlds. Some of these worlds are better represented in the corridors of power than others are. And I think it is so, but that's where Gandhi lives on. You know, all see the Indian nationalism that we sometimes now criticize and forgotten. One, I think one of its virtue was that it it told us to keep the poor in mind. You know, Tagore had a poem we all read in our childhood, where he said the puja, and he meant the Durga puja, wouldn't be complete if the beggar female girl child still was standing outside the threshold of your door, and you didn't invite her in. So the, the nationalism that we all grew up with, even though, you know, whatever was the relationship between, let's say, uh, uh, Nehru and Purusutam Das, you know, Thakur Das and all these people, whatever the relation, the Bombay plan was made by business people. But even the business people, I mean, there was a nationalism that in which the poor was always remembered. There's a very, you know, we criticize Nehru's dams. There's a very interesting speech by Nehru. Uh, I think at the dam building site, and I forget which one, where he says to the engineer, you know, he sees all these small people with the baskets of uh, concrete or uh, sand or whatever, taking up, going up the scaffolding. And he says to the engineer, have you explained to these people why they're working? Have you explained to them why we are building a dam? And the engineer says, no, we don't, we have no art. And he says, no, no, they have to understand what building India is. Because, I mean, today we criticize because we know that dams displace people, dams, dams cause problems. But Nehru was, Nehru was not unaware of the problem, but he was thinking that people will bear these costs so that the country could advance. But therefore, therefore people had to know why they were working, what, why they were working. See, I'm not saying it, the engineer was more the part of reality than Nehru was. Mostly you didn't tell people, right? But again, I'm just telling you the story of Kerala and West Bengal to tell you that the dystopia is here for some people. And that's why they move. And it's a human reality that we don't want people to move into our areas, even though we have moved and taken somebody else. You know, the Europeans have gone to other parts of the world, taken their land, and then now they want, don't want other people to come in. And, but we are facing a world in which people will have to move. And we will, we will, we need more cosmopolitanism. We need more openness. Uh, but on the other hand, the trend in world politics, many places over, is to create a kind of hyper nationalism. That then, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'll tell you, and I won't name the person, but one of my ex IM friends, it really was a, I felt ashamed. Uh, he sent me a very obscene picture with a kangaroo and a pig as his way of celebrating Australians' victory over Pakistan. Now, that's not a sentiment that is going to service the world that we are entering. That's all I can say. Thank you. Please, next question. Thank you, sir, for all the teaching here. Uh, in Guru Granth Sahib, it is written, Pavan Guru Pani Pita Mata Tat Mahatma. Here also it is written, Pani Pita Mata Tat Mahatma. Here also it is written, Pani Pita Mata Tat Mahatma. Here also it is written, Pani Pita Mata Tat Mahatma. Dhoti Amade Mata. Ita Amade Guru Granth Sahib One Kaage Teke Amade Sekhan Hoche. Kintu Aajke Amra Ita Manchi Na Bole Amra Ii Kursi Kide Aajke. To Mala Aapni Deta Bole Amade Mala Sekha Te Aave Aar Ita Ke Implement Kote Aave. To Ita Kole Amade Laab Aajke. 
আমরা শিখছি পবন গুরু কিন্তু আজকের ডেটে গোল্ডেন টেম্পলে ফায়ার ওয়ার্কস হয় আমরা জানি বিপবন গুরু কিন্তু আমরা ফায়ার ওয়ার্কস করছি গোল্ডেন টেম্পলে আর ভি মানে আমরা ওইগুলো মানে করছি না তাই জন্য আজকে আমরা এই পরিস্থিতিতে আছি তো আপনি একটা ভালো জায়গা আছে তো এই জিনিসগুলো যদি মানে ভালোভাবে বোঝানো যেতে পারে ইমপ্লিমেন্ট করা যেতে পারে তাহলে আমরা আগে আমাদের পরিবার বা আমাদের আসার লোককে আমরা ভালোভাবে ইমপ্লিমেন্ট করে দিতে পারবো থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ আমি কি এটাতে রেসপন্ড করব তাহলে আমি এই আমি এইটুকুই বলতে পারি যে লোকেরা অনেক সময় জিজ্ঞেস করে আমি বাংলায় বলছি উনি বাংলায় বলেন বলে অনেক সময় জিজ্ঞেস করে যে আমরা প্যান্ডেমিক থেকে কি শিখছি কি শিক্ষা নিতে পারি তো প্যান্ডেমিকের একটা প্রাথমিক শিক্ষা তো এটাই ছিল যে মানুষ যখন বাধ্য হয় একটু সরে আসতে তখন বাতাস পরিষ্কার হয় আকাশ পরিষ্কার হয় পুরনো পাখিরা ফিরে আসে অনেক জন্তু ফিরে আসে তারা সর্বদা আমাদের কাছে স্বাগত নয় কিন্তু ফিরে আসে ফলে এটা তো একটা দৃশ্যমান চাক্ষুষ শিক্ষা ছিল এবং আমি যে উইথড্রয়ালের কথা বলছিলাম যে ডেলিভারি উইথড্রয়ালের কথা বলছিলাম সেটা তো আমরা আমাদের একটা ফোর্স উইথড্রয়াল হয়েছিল কিন্তু আমরা যদি বারবার ভাবি যে আমাদের ভবিষ্যৎটা মানে একটা ফিরে যাওয়া টু দ্য ওল্ড স্টেট এবং তাহলে আমরা আমি বলি প্যান্ডেমিক থেকে আমরা সত্যিকারের শিক্ষা কিছু পাইনি মানে মূল্যবোধের লেভেলে কোনো শিক্ষা পাইনি Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Any, 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 anyone? anyone? Okay. okay. I think there is no there more question. No more question. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You all stay well and I'll leave now. Yeah. Bye bye.